just to introduce myself, um, my name is Chris. I go by Hydroplane and IRC. I uh, participate in DC801, great group. If you're into a lot of things at the con, I think you, know, you want to do that like year round, uh, DC801 is a great place to go check out. Um, just kind of an assessment so I know kind of what your experience is with TLS is how many of you have used Let's Encrypt on your website? Okay, so a few. How many of you have configured uh, TLS for your websites in the past? Okay, okay, cool. So I've, my kind of background with TLS and uh, SSL is I, a long time ago, I got hired to do like an e-commerce, uh, like to code for an e-commerce package. And the you know, certificate expired and nobody knew how to handle it. And so I started into it and it became a rabbit hole. You know, the more and more I got into it, the more and more there was. So, um, you know, there's about, you know, two years ago, I kind of frustrated with some of the CAs and then, you know, Let's Encrypt came out and it's made, it made a big difference. I'm sure some people are not making as much money as they used to on certificates, but we'll go into kind of the background, um, why we would care for it, and then kind of some of the details about configuration, some little gotchas that if you aren't aware of those type of things can make a difference. So we'll start with the story then. This is kind of how we got to where we're at. Uh, you know, 1989, uh, Tim Berners-Lee at CERN uh, invents the web. And you know, his probably interest in, at the time was just sharing and making research information available. He really didn't understand you know, what impact the web would ultimately have on our society. And poly encryption, I mean, that really wasn't something that was an issue, uh, that, or at least not considered to be an issue. But you come with the early 90s and the web becomes this, a big thing. And really at that time, like Netscape was the browser um, before IE kind of ate up all the market share. But they realized, you know, they, I guess they're seeing the potential and they realized we need to get some type of uh, encryption security on the web. So they started out, SSL v1 never even reached the public. They, they had some problems. I don't think they had actually full-time security people at Netscape. It was kind of like an amateur job, and when they tried to put it out, they got de you know demonstrated the weaknesses. So if you these early iterations v2 and v3, you know they they're you could see you know the primitive level it was at. And also, you know, it's about a few years later, TLS version one, which was really a redesign, uh, fixed some things, but all this happens before 2000. And you're, you're, a lot of the attacks you're gonna see against TLS, a lot of it has to do with the legacy that uh, during all this work was during the crypto wars when the government said you couldn't export anything with really decent encryption strength. And so like say for example logjam or some of these fall back on that weaknesses because the uh, export control you can you can get it to fall back and then you can you, they're much easier to attack. Um, so you know you come up 2000 after 2000 you have you know it's quite some time 1.1 one of the biggest things it fixed was uh, with uh, Cypher blockchains. Um, the initialization vector was kind of an issue with 1.0, and we'll go over that. And 1.2 came out shortly after that. And one of the things you'll notice with the how close between 1.1 and 1.2 is a lot of the clients, a lot of the browsers you're going to deal with, if you look at them, there's like this either it supports 1.0 and it supports 1.2, you're not gonna see a lot of clients like web browsers that support 1.1 because you know, it really the, the timing didn't give you that. 
in about the last five years, SSL has fallen. The old standard with different weaknesses, different attacks, they finally said no. They, uh, they're officially de deprecated. Not that you won't see it. There's one company that my company works with that I wanted to get them up into TLS and they're basically saying we don't we don't have the technical skills to upgrade. And so I build one machine and support TLS, or sorry, SSL V3 for them. And it's on an isolated machine. I really would like to kill that, but my company says they're still gonna do it. So TLS 1.3, there's a lot of details available about it, but it hasn't come out yet. Um, there's some value, I mean, cha-cha 20, and we'll go into that, coming out with that. So that's kind of how we got here. But why, right? Why care? Why encrypt? Um, the obvious case, the case that when you're in the late 90s, you use SSL to protect financial transactions. That was like, you don't encrypt anything else, because at that time, it was kind of it's hurt your performance but encrypt when you do financial transactions. Then we came and figured maybe more than financial information is valuable. And that's where we got into you know, identity theft prevention. And now maybe you would encrypt forms, you know, pages with forms on that and that traffic, you would encrypt it even if it wasn't financial. And those are kind of the ones I think a lot of people, even if you're not technical, you understand it, or hopefully you do. The two, last two that I'm gonna talk about in this uh, why were maybe not quite so obvious. Uh, in 2015, there's a, a story in Ars Technica where uh, Comcast was doing um, content injection on web pages. If you connected to one of their open Wi-Fi access points, they were actually in, inserting content on those pages. And then there's also a Verizon uh, had the super cookie where they put a header in. Uh, I know, you know, you know so maybe you don't, maybe it doesn't matter as much. There's a question yesterday during the uh, Let's Encrypt presentation where someone says, well, if it's a stack page, why? Why would you care? The reason is, like my company, they actually have lawyers review everything on our web page, review your content. And there, apparently there is uh, a, if you do like get a insurance policy, they're actually checking for your content review. They want to know that you're, you're, you're being careful with your content. Well, if someone can come and basically graffiti your website because you didn't encrypt it, you know, inject things onto your pages. That might be a reason, even if you're not collecting personal information, even if you're not doing financial transactions, that you want to encrypt uh, those pages. You know, static page, but if you want to protect your message, uh, HTTPS will help you there. And obviously the 2013, the Snowden things were basically there uh, getting the NSA and other intelligence agencies are doing mass surveillance. They're basically like the UK does full take and then can do analysis on that. So, you know, those are some pretty good reasons why you would want to use, you know, HTTPS encrypt your websites. And basically all the, there are different variations, but the core it's the man in the middle attack. Basically, either they can observe or they can manipulate your content. And there are some other attacks, but this is basically what people are trying to do. Uh, if you know, and what HTTPS tries to protect you against. So you know, we know why. Why isn't every website using HTTPS? Up until you know last year, it cost money to get a certificate most of the time. There were a few places you could get a free certificate 
not an easy, it wasn't. But I mean, you could get some free certificates, but most of the time people were paying, what, $10? I think uh, GoDaddy was $70. You've got a, a discount code, it was $50 for, uh, for a single site, like $300 for a wild card. I just, you know, I mean, when your company, you know, when you have to justify every expense, you know, you encrypting the pages is just seen as an expense. I, my current company has a number of websites, about over a thousand. And if I encrypted each one of those, we'll say GoDaddy, you know, that's what, $50 times a thousand, you know, $50,000. Is my, you know, I'm gonna have a hard time selling that to my company. Uh, so cost was an issue. Then really doing TLS manually, it can be an involved task. You can probably do it wrong really easily. And so, you know, if you don't have the technical time and you don't, you don't want to figure it out, you know, that's another problem with the TLS. And the last one is a lot of people, I mean, they're, they're still asking why. They don't see the value yet in doing it. So th I think it's a combination of all those three things that is why you know, web, way, encryption, encrypting the web wasn't a big thing. This kind of is a, more, a somewhat simplified, but still gives you the, the story of what happens during a connection. There's a first little bit, hey, hi, hi. Then they try to figure out uh, how they're going to exchange the key. I'll talk a little bit more about that. And then what cipher uh, suite they're going to use. And then the get and the response happens. Without TLS, basically a normal HTTP is just the last two arrows, get and, re uh, get and, re and a reply or re request response. Now, uh, one thing about this, uh, how many of you host more than one website on a single web server? Do some of that, right, the SNI. Um, one thing, if you want to have different TLS configurations for one site versus another, that, the TLS happens, uh, the handshake happens before the site. So if you try to like say you have to run an old site for someone that just can't support the newer versions of TLS, those, uh, those you want to run now on a different server because this handshake happens before the site is identified. And that can be a kind of a gotcha. If you're trying to like why doesn't, why can't I have strong security for this site and a weaker security on this site on, on the same box? The handshake happens before the site is identified. Kind of a gotcha. So we talk about key exchange. And here's our classic Alice, Bob, and uh, Eve situation. What happens is, say you have a message that you want to you know, send from one, site, uh, one party to another. If you send the, the key along the same channel, the person that can sniff your uh, message can sniff the key. You know, the, there really is no security. So the key exchange is how we solve that problem, how we get this, uh, the key over there without a third party being able to see what's going on. And here's kind of an RSA example, basically with the public and private key. Uh, the client, in this case, uh, says, I'm going to use, this will be our shared key. I'm going to encrypt it with your private key, send it over uh, or with your public key. Then you're going to use your uh, private key to decrypt it. And now we've shared our secret. And this is basically what happens during RSA key exchange. And basically, now that you've shared your, your key, now, Eve, you know, she gets the me encrypted message and she gets the encrypted key. She can't really do anything with it. And that's what a key exchange does in TLS. Now, there are kind of basically two ways you're going to see in the wild for the key exchange. RSA, which was here from the very beginning of, TL of SSL, 
uh, basically is a key transfer. The one party just, uh, figures out what the key is, encrypts it, sends it to the other party, and the party uses a private key to decrypt it. Now, with key transfer, is if someone if the if the server's private key is compromised, they can see they they've sniffed all the other traffic. They can see everything that ever happened. There is no forward secrecy with RSA, just because you know the way it's a key transfer. Now, with key agreement, which is basically what the Diffie Hellman approach does, is that you all know, parties share some information, but uh, the, the, the private key isn't how, uh, what protects the, uh, the, uh, the conversation. So basically, if you want to configure TLS for forward secrecy, use uh, Diffie-Hellman ephemeral or elliptic curve Diffie-Hellman. Um, I, I highlighted the elliptic, elliptic curve Diffie-Hellman because... Uh, that's uh, the uh, the old Diffie-Hellman exchange. There was an attack about a year ago, logjam, against uh, the Diffie-Hellman uh, primes. And so if you don't want to complicate your configuration, using elliptic curve Diffie-Hellman uh, in your key exchange will give you forward secrecy and it's probably harder to make a mistake. So that's preferred. You're going to notice that there's Diffie-Hellman RSA and then elliptic, uh, lip, um, uh, then elliptic curve diff, uh, DSA. RSA is still the most popular, like most C uh, CAs, including Let's Encrypt. Most uh, most certificates right now are RSA uh, uh, are RS, are based on RSA. Uh, elliptic curve, why you would be interested, why it, you, you, you care, is that elliptic curves have much smaller key sizes, uh, better for resource-constrained situations, for example, mobile. You want, you know, and especially like Android devices, RSA you know, really puts it on the, the hardware it works, but it doesn't perform as well as elliptic curves. So the key part, I would say in remembering this, is that key agreement is better than key transfer. And that's kind of, I, this is a famous uh, color exchange from Wikipedia, but basically it demonstrates in here that you're not sharing the key, but you kind of, it's a mechanism for coming to an agreement on the key. So that, that's how you get forward secrecy, is a key agreement, not key transfer. So the next step in the uh, TLS is the cipher suite. Basically, now that we got our key exchanged, how do we uh, you know, communicate what ciphers we do we use? There are more ciphers available than this, but these are the ones you're gonna see in a while. These are the ones that most browsers have, uh, have or, or do support. Um, RC4 and D DES were the early ones. I think it was late 90s, I can't remember which year, but EFF uh, had a project called Deep Crack where they demonstrated that DES was, was too weak. I think they, they, at first they cracked it and it was like, took them a few weeks and then it came back and it was like a, a few days or a few hours. And so I, that, by the late 90s we knew that DES really didn't hold up. Uh, RC4 held out for a long time. Uh, I think it really was about last year when people proved that RC4 had some problems that so you really can't trust it to protect you anymore. So those, the, you know, hopefully your configurations, please know. Friends don't let friends use RC4. Um, you're gonna see triple DES and you'll still see it in use right now. And triple DES was kind of a stopgap. Once we knew D, uh, DES was broken, we didn't really have anything to replace it with. And so they basically you know, uh, manipulated uh, DES and made it a little bit stronger. In the meantime, it's like early 2000s, you have AES that comes out. 
AES is still solid. It's you know trusted, um, and it's probably the most prominent one, and probably the one you'll probably use right now. Uh, Cha Cha 20, which is uh, Daniel J. Bernstein, uh, I hope I pronounced that right. He developed it. It's a stream cipher. We lost, with our, our RC4, we lost our stream cipher. But Cha Cha 20 gives us a stream cipher. Now, um, Cha Cha 20, you're, if you, how many of you have actually seen this in your TLS? Uh, have you seen it around? Probably no, not too many. Uh, Google has been the one to push ChaCha 20. It is in a uh, draft for TLS 1.3, but Google has a you know with Android hardware where they can't they're not sure what the quality is on hardware. Because people you have different manufacturers producing their devices. ChaCha 20 is not is re, uh, computationally as expensive as AES. So it's been a Google that's been pushing ChaCha 20 forward. But basically, if you're using AES and ChaCha 20, those are two solid options. And mo most of the time right now, because of the libraries, so you're probably using OpenSSL on your server. Uh, the latest version supports ChaCha 20, but most of your package management doesn't have that yet especially if you're on like a LTS of Ubuntu. So AES is going to be your, probably your best option right now. Now, is, you know, you have an AES, a, which is our block cipher. You have to, how you use it is as important as using it. Uh, electronic code book, which if you can, you know, we'll look that up on Wikipedia, fails spectacularly with like the same, same data. Um, so it's introducing some variation. Cypher blockchain, which is the example shown here, is probably is currently the most popular um, uh, mode for the cypher bl uh, block mode. Um, you're also going to see GCM Galois counter mode. Uh, I would say that GCM is better. The only the reason why you wouldn't use it and nothing else is that uh, a lot of clients mostly Mac clients, uh, a little bit old, not the latest version, only support Cypher blockchain. So if you went for GCM, the problem you would have is you lose compatibility with a, with a number of not that distant clients. So basically, for a message authentication code, basically this is the integrity check. In the, and things that are being sent back and forth. Right now, I'd say SHA-2 or better, or authenticate encryption. GCM is an example of the authenticated encryption. SHA-1 is either deprecated or on its way to being deprecated. Um, you'll still see a lot of support for it, but I would avoid SHA-1. I can understand maybe wanting to use SHA-1 for compatibility, but I'm not a fan. And MD5 has been broken nearly a decade, so you'll still see it as an option, but please no. This is a, uh, a, a table from the Bulletproof SSL and TLS, and if you want to dig deep into TLS configurations, I highly recommend the book. Ivan Ristic wrote it, and he's basically considered the expert in the field. Um, Basically, I would uh, get out of this is that uh, elliptic curve obviously offers, compared to the normal RSA asymmetric, uh, about the same security margin for much smaller key sizes. So I think the future will be elliptic curves. Um, so certificate authorities. Um, not all of them are bad, but there has been a lot of abuse in, in historically, and that's why I have a, uh, my, the feelings I have towards a lot of them. Um, but before we talk about any specific people, um, basically, CA, all they do is they give the trust the clients have in them, and they give it to you. When they sign you, that's basically they're extending trust. Now there's three levels 
and some of you may already be familiar with this, domain validation, they don't do a whole lot of checks. In fact, this can be totally automated. All they have to do is, do, do you control the domain? Yes, I, you can prove you control the domain. Here's a search. Uh, with org and extended, there's additional, or there's supposed to be additional measures taken to you know, improve, uh, prove that you're like a legitimate business. Um, I don't know what more value they really give you. I mean, it, I guess it's up to you. Uh, they do usually cost significantly more. And yeah. Now what happens is all those CAs basically are trusted by your client. Depending on how you use Firefox, uh, Edge, uh, Chrome. If you go in there, you're going to see a whole bunch of CAs in your configuration. And that uh, basically, because their root certificates are there, they uh, basically the client uh, trusts them. And now, they, those root certificates spend their lives in people's safes. They hardly ever get used. Uh, what happens is they sign intermediate certificates and your website will usually be signed by those intermediates. Uh, one, one issue in this is say your website, say you're, you go to GoDaddy and you get, your web, uh, you get your certificate from them, they sign it. If someone can uh, somehow get semantic to sign a certificate for your website, you know, they, it trusts not just the right certificate authority, any certificate authority is trusted. And that's kind of a big weakness in the system. There are some measures that, uh, like your public key pinning, which I'll go into detail, and how to mitigate some of that risk in that. So where we started out, 95, we had Monopoly. VeriSign was spun off from RSA and they had a license to use RSA algorithm and a non-compete agreement. So basically they had a monopoly. Uh, they were the only company and they acted like, like monopoly is what you would expect them to act. And there's a lot of people not happy about this. And you know, after the RSA you know, patent expires, you end up with a cartel. Not anybody can be a CA. You have to go through a lot of hoops uh, uh, to, to satisfy things and to become a CA. So up until you know, Let's Encrypt came out, this really was well, the landscape you had. There's more than this. I think there's like 160 CAs that are trusted by browsers, like anywhere from China to a few others. And to my knowledge, only one of them has actually ever had, you know, even though there's been a number of problems with some CAs, I think only one of them's actually ever been told, You're, we're not going to trust you anymore. And I think that was actually Fire, um, Fire Mozilla recently with some CA in China that they basically said, you know, no, you, we can't, we're not going to trust you because, you know, there's the problems you've had. Not all of them are bad. You know, semantic, if you look in their previous thing, VeriSign and semantic, basically semantic inherited or picked up VeriSign. That's why you use the logo detail. DigiCert is actually a Utah company. They only do extended validation. They only do like, you, like your green bar on your browser. The, that's extended validation and that's what DigiCert does. Start.com, I mentioned them. Uh, they were actually, uh, they were giving out free certificates. I wouldn't say it was easy. I actually got a few from them. But they were actually offering f uh, free certificates before Let's Encrypt came out. So some alternatives. Uh, there's been a lot of, even before Let's Encrypt came out, there are a lot of people wanting to change the system. And some examples, uh, Convergence.io, uh, Moxie Marlin Spike wrote an article in 2011 talked about SSL and the future of authenticity. And basically, you know, he doesn't like the CA system. And so he's proposing an alternative called convergence.io, where the users could pick uh, what are basically notaries 
who would uh, sign, uh, would say, I trust this, I trust this, I trust this, instead of you anchoring your trust in the CAs. Um, you notice the beta tag? That's, uh, that was there until the site went dead about a month ago. So that, you know, it was, a, it was an effort, but it really never got off the ground. CA search, how many of you have ever done a CA search signing party? I don't see Aaron in here, so. Anyways, uh, CA sort was kind of meant to be a more of a community. You, you know, people vouch, you identify people. Um, and in Linux, you'll see their certs, but they've never gotten their main browsers. So they, you know, while they're still a thing, they never reach that critical mass necessary to really change the game. Uh, obviously, we're, we're going to talk about in a little bit more detail today, let's encrypt. And, you know, I started out about a year before the Snowden revelations, but I think it got a lot more, um, you know, momentum after that. But uh, let's encrypt has, is, is the game changer. And not saying that everything's perfect now, but it has changed a lot of the landscape. So we're going to talk about you know how what it, what it is and how you can use it. So what Let's Encrypt part of what Let's Encrypt is is it's automated, where instead of having to do go through and manually do uh, you know do validation, although most of the web uh, CAs currently it's pretty much automated also, but all uh, they use what's called Acme. And basically, there's two things. They just you prove domain control, so it's basically domain validation, and then you can perform operations. You can request, renew, revoke your certificates. It's really actually that simple. There are now they have the Boulder is their actual server. The client is what you'll use. Uh, the client that's been around since early on with the project and kind of separate EFFs managing this one is called CertBot. If you were playing with Let's Encrypt a while back, it was just called Let's Encrypt, but they've rebranded it. That's one I'm gonna show you some examples of. It's one I recommend because it's the, got the most maturity. There are some other interesting uh, uh, agents. Caddy, which I think Matt Holt, uh, I don't know if he's in the room. He went to BYU. He wrote his own web server. And as part of it, it automatically gets Let's Encrypt certificates. So interesting. There's a few others. They actually have Certify, which allows you to do Let's Encrypt on Windows. And there are more. There's a ton more. So and everyone can pretty much write their own certificate, uh, their own uh, client because this, the specification is pretty open. In order to install CertBot, uh, who here is running, say, Ubuntu 16.4 or newer? Okay, so some new, some people. On uh, Ubuntu 16.4, it's actually they have the client is actually part of your package management, but it's not called CertBot. It's still called Let's Encrypt. So apt get install uh, Let's Encrypt will give you the cert bot. For pretty much everyone else and every other operating system, uh, I really suggest using wget and then uh, and, you know, enabling execution. It's a Python script, basically. And it, you know, you don't, as long as you're on something that has like version 2.7 uh, two or later of Python, it'll work. So that's install. Uh, for Apache, like who here runs like say a WordPress site, like a LAMP site? A few, okay. You can pretty much run, you know, like a, like a single command, it'll do all your configuration, you won't have to worry about the details. Um, for some of the other clients, you'll have to do some, like some of the, your configuration. For, for, for Apache, it's pretty much, it can be auto magic for you. So here's some exa example commands. Again, if you're using Apache and you, all you, you don't worry about doing any configuration, certbot auto, 
answer some questions. He's going to ask for your email address and for you to agree to terms of service, and he'll do all the configuration for you. If you are not technical, or if you have someone that's, that you you want to help them and they're not technical, it doesn't get much easier. It does everything. Uh, if you want to get the certificate from Let's Encrypt, but you want to manage how you configure it because you want to enable this and disable that, you can just get the certificate. Uh, then for renewal, uh, Let's Encrypt certificates only last three months, and then you have to renew them. So what I would recommend is basically create a cron job and add the cert bot to renew. And that way, it, you don't have to think about it. You don't, or if someone doesn't come in, hey, your certificate expired. It's just automatic. What's that? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, whatever automatic timed you know, approach you do, just run renew, and it'll take care of that. There are a lot more options. I'm not going to try to bury you. That you can basically, you can have uh, Let's Encrypt can actually sign um, elliptic curve. So if you create your own key that's say elliptic curve, they can use the RSA key to sign yours. And I think it's going to be next year they're going to have a um, elliptic curve intermediate that you can use. But uh, there's a lot more details. By default, Let's Encrypt uh, gives you a 2048 RSA key. That's what it generates for you. You can, by command line option, make it 4096. There's, there's some more details, but I don't want to bury you with that. There's more documentation at the bottom. So that's just getting, that's all you really need to use Let's Encrypt. But if you want to optimize it, if you want to you know, tweak it because you know, you're curious and you want your all optimal configuration, we'll go into some of the details on that. How many of you have tested your websites with SSL Labs? It's like the most popular place to test your websites, right? Um, I like it. It's, it gives you a lot of good, useful information. Another really good one is called HT Bridge. It kind of gives you a little bit more detail on your key exchange. So if you want to look at that, uh, that's a good scan. If you don't want to uh, put, uh, you know, scan it in front of the whole world, uh, an example, an end map where you can basically run their scripts and it'll come back and give you the details of your configuration. I found that useful personally. And obviously a really kind of primitive with just using OpenSSL. One thing when you get into configuration, when you optimize, uh, you know, there's kind of two considerations, right? I want to make it as secure as I can, uh, or I want to make it compatible, or you want some combination in the middle. Just realize that when you start optimizing, compatibility may be what you, what you lose. And maybe you won't care. Maybe like Internet Explorer, if you're not running Internet Explorer 11 or newer, you know, just upgrade. You're, that may be your position on that. Uh, if you want to use AES-256, then Java natively doesn't support AES-256 yet. They do support 128. So uh, this is a site where I used to do all my configurations manually. I like this one. Uh, this gives you really solid configurations if you don't want to dig into details, but uh, you know, kind of tune your configuration. Mozilla's SSL configuration generator is really good. And the URL's right there. There are some issues, like earlier I mentioned, like the, you trust any CA. And say your certificate, you get it issued, but then something like, say, Heartbleed happens where you can't trust that your key might not have been compromised. Uh, things happen, and your certificate will say it's good until like next year. But say your key gets compromised. How do you let other people know? How do other people find out that maybe something's happened to your key? Basically, this you know, allows uh, some type of man in the middle type of attack, right? The two mechanisms 
uh, uh, have exist and do exist are CRL and OCSP. CRL stands for Certificate Revocation List. And basically, it's, meant, it's kind of modeled after if you had a corporate environment, you would check that list to make sure something's valid. There's a lot of issues with it, and that's why OCSP came out. OCSP, Open Certificate Status Protocol. You could basically make a query to the CA and say, is this certificate still valid? Um, and it, it's better, but there is something, there's an approach that you can do in your configuration, so I'll show you an example configuration, where you can make it more efficient. So on the left-hand side, is without stapling. Basically, a request goes to your website, and it has to make an, another two requests to go and do your check your uh, certificate status. With stapling, what you do is you include your uh, the OCSP response in your uh, your uh, with your certificate and uh, with the request, and that way they only have to make one request instead of having to make they only have two requests instead of making four. One issue with performance on uh, OCS, uh, OCSP is browsers will usually time out. They'll maybe make an effort to check, but if, if the response isn't soon, they'll give up. They're not going to, it's a performance issue. By stapling, you fix that. So I will demonstrate in the configurations we have here on that. Another detail, and this is the part about mitigating if, a, if another CA somehow issues a certificate for your site, key pinning uh, can mitigate that. I've configured a few sites. It isn't really simple, and you don't see a lot of sites yet use key pinning. But the idea about the key pinning is if you visit me and I have this header if the client will, will remember that header, and next time it requests, it, it makes another request. If the key, if the certificate doesn't match what it was stored, it says, "I don't trust you," and that that helps mitigate the problem with, of basically being any CA is trusted universally. Uh, I don't see a lot of public key pinning configured yet. I've done it, my example configurations will show you how that's done, but I don't see that really prominent. Hopefully it gets to be a bigger thing. There are some complications and we will talk about it. One thing, a complication is where do you pin? With Let's Encrypt, if you pin on your website certificate, your, your site certificate expires in three months, right? Because Let's Encrypt issues new certificates. Um, if you if you uh, pin on the root, you're kind of leaving it a little too open. You know, maybe an intermediate certificate authority gets fooled and issues a certificate. So I think, uh, honestly, I think the best position is the intermediate certificate. And I'll show you my examples where, where you put that. But the intermediate certificate isn't as uh, ephemeral as your site one is, but isn't as universal as a root one is. So it's a good place to pin. Now with strict tran uh, transport security, let's say this scenario, you're, you get, you're at the airport, uh, you're you wanna check your bank account. Usually not a good idea, right? But, uh, so you open up your browser, and you type in usaa.com or whatever your bank is. And you know, a site comes up, looks legit. You know, you're entering your username, password, because you're not looking in the in a, in a address bar to make sure it's HTTPS. And so someone potentially could man in the middle of you with that. Uh, what strict transport security, the way, way that fixes that is when you visit a site, say you visit your bank at home, in, in, you're including a header to the client and you're telling your client only uh, uh, only connect you being using HTTPS. So like later on you go to the airport and you're pulling it up. If you tries to pull up HTTP it says no. You know, I was told last time I visited your site only use HTTPS. That's what strict transport security provides. 
Now, in the airport example, if we continue it with preloading, say you just barely bought that computer and you open it up at, at the airport. Well, it, without preloading, without knowing in advance, it might accept the HTTP because it never visited and got the header to start with. Preloading is basically a way for you to get uh, to, uh, your, uh, your site in the browsers so that it will know that only to go HTTPS to start with. And the, the URL at the bottom is where you can submit your site for, uh, to be preloaded. But there is a detail in your configuration that you need to take care of before you do this, or they won't accept you. And I'll show you the detail on that. So let's go into some configurations. How many of you, before we get too far, ha run web servers on Windows? I know you might not be, yeah. We, our company runs a few. And it can be painful to configure uh, the details of your TLS configuration on Windows. This is a tool we, uh, we, I've used personally in the past by our company. And it's probably, you know, short of doing registration, uh, registry keys, going into your registry and modifying that manually, this is the best tool for that, for configuring on Windows. Uh, so we're, the first example is we're going to go over Nginx. Who uses Nginx? Quite a few. Okay. So the first part is I don't accept HTTP. I redirect anyone that comes at me via HTTP to the HTTPS. That way, you know, if someone comes at you, simple. Now this is where it gets a little bit interesting. You know, the, most of this configuration will be familiar. You have your certificate, you have your key, protocols. Who here uh, does any PCI, like it takes credit cards? A lot of us, right? Uh, the PCI DSS 3.2 and 3.1, basically you should be using uh, 1.2, uh, TLS 1.2. I, unless you have a legacy grandfather situations and a plan to move forward, you have to use TLS 1.2. Now, one problem with that is it does break some of your compatibility, right? Some older things, but frankly, people should need to upgrade if you're not compatible with TLS 1.2. On the ciphers, this is, I have another example for Apache that's much shorter. But basically, I, I, uh, I support the elliptic curve AES with the authentic encryption, one point, uh, 256 and then 128. I like GCM first. GCM gives me authentic encryption. It's the better, better option. I will support, so because I want for compatibility, uh, ba uh, basically Cypher blockchain. And that's what my last two are. And that way I get you know, good security and decent amount of compatibility with that. Now the next line may be kind of odd or seem odd. Uh, with the elliptic curve Diffie-Hellman, with an Nginx with versions I think 1.9 or older, they default the curve they use was a 256 uh, bit curve. And the problem is it wasn't as strong. If you do like SSL lab scan, they will knock you on your configuration. So by including this line, I'm basically saying use a, a, high, a stronger elliptic curve. If you're using a later version of uh, Nginx, you won't have to worry about this. But if you're using a little bit older, that will help you with your uh, key exchange. Prefer server ciphers. You want to really control this dance. Now we go into the probably the most interesting part in this. Enable stapling, it's literally that easy. Uh, oh yes, with uh, Let's Encrypt, you can request a certificate that says requires stapling. And that's kind of a nice thing in that. Now there's two headers I put in here. First one is my strict tr transport security. And basically I say, you know, a certain period of time, I think that's like six months or something like that, include my subdomains, so not just my main website. The preload is what you need to do. If you want to get your stuff on 
uh, STS preload, you need to include that little part in the header. If you don't, then it won't preload. It's really that simple for that. Now for Republic key pins, I use two pins. You have to at least use two pins. One of them is not active. You can have more, you can pin on more than two, but you need a minimum of two, and, and only one of them is currently active. So like the first one would be like the one I get from Let's Encrypt, they're intermediate, and the other one might be like a Komodo certificate from another CA. And the reason why they want more than one pin is so that if something happens and you have to fall back, uh, because it's not going to trust if it doesn't match the pin, they want you to have some reserve in there. The RFC will require at least two and one will not, only one in use. And that is the most interesting part in the example for Nginx. Apache, I do the same thing. I redirect all HTTP to HTTPS. Ooh, sorry about the time. I'll keep going here. Um, then I, this, this is probably the most interesting part. And Cypress Suite, I have just basically AES with the elliptic curve, Diffie-Hellman, ephemeral. And they, so instead of that big long line, if you put that in there, you, yeah, that will lock your stuff down. One warning is Java will be broken because it doesn't support 256. Stapling, then I have my headers. Uh, basically my public keys and my strict transport security. The slides are available through a conference, so I'm not going to you know, drag you out here. But you know, those are good examples. Um, I know I'm a little bit over time. Is there any questions? Okay, I have bad eyesight, so if I don't catch you, I'm sorry about that. <laughs> okay, so if you don't remember anything else, I say dance like no one is watching and encrypt like everyone is. So thank you for coming. Oh. Oh. Yeah.